you're coming to the magic trick talk, I have a survey before my talk starts, right? So I don't use my allotted time for this. So please feel free to talk among yourselves. I'm going to ask you a question and ask for an answer by a show of hands. And so this is what the question is going to be. What person, okay, and it's not about your code. So you don't have a conflict of interest. You're not going to out yourself here in front of your teammates. The question is, what percent of the code that you see is tested at some person? Some, well, is, is the code that you see tested at 100%, 80%, 60%, 40%, 20%, or 0%? Right? So I want, I want you to tell me about the code that you see, how well it's tested. So if the code that you see is 100% tested, raise your hand. You are lucky people. All right. <laughs> 80%, if the code you see is 80% tested, all right, 60, 40, 20, zero. <laughs> so if, you're, if you were in the 50% or less category, raise your hand. All right, so now the talk starts. We are the people who embrace testing. We're the clan that drank the Kool-Aid. This is our public persona. But you don't have to look around the room very far to see that many people, perfectly legitimate, completely respectable, card-carrying members of our community, say this about their tests. I hate my tests. Some of you are saying this. I hate my tests. So why is it that you hate your tests? Well, you hate them because they kill your productivity. They're slow. Off we go to Twitter. Who knows when we'll be back? <laughs> slow tests kill us. You hate them because you can make a little change in your app, and the app still works. It's perfectly fine, but it broke all the tests. And now you have to go fix all those tests before you can come back and get real work done. It's frustrating. This feels like such a waste of time. If your tests are slow and they break every time you change something, it is rational to begin to wonder if they're worth it. Everyone says you should have them, and they, might, they probably save you just often enough so that you're afraid to delete them all. But the cold, hard truth is they make you miserable. If this is where you are right now, you are not alone. For many people, the promise of testing has not been fulfilled. And fortunately, it doesn't have to be this way. You can have cost-effective tests. Good tests aren't magic. They're magic tricks. And since they're tricks, you can learn them. There's just a few tricks. They're simple and straightforward. They're not obvious, but they are simple. And I'm going to tell you these tricks in the next 28 minutes. And for most of you, they're going to involve some form of every programmer's favorite thing, deleting tests. <laughs> I think you have too many tests, and you're testing the wrong sorts of things. Or at least you did back when you wrote tests. You wrote too many tests, and that was so painful that now, that you, now you write too few or none at all. So today's talk is about unit tests. The magic tricks apply to unit tests. This talk is not about integration tests. So integration tests are end-to-end -end testing, right? There's a big cloud. I know you cannot. I feel like I need to jump up and down. There's a big cloud that's your app. And an integration test, like you poke one side, and a bunch of objects and messages go. And then the answer, some change comes out the other. And the integration test does the poke and checks the, the distant side effect. Unit tests are just the opposite. They narrow the focus down until the entire universe is a single object. And that object is all a unit test knows about. So at a, at a molecular level, your unit test uh, proves that every cell behaves correctly. And the integration test is, is proof that the beast is alive. So, so this is what we want out of unit tests. We want them to be thorough. We want them to prove logically and completely that that single object under test is behaving correctly. We want them to be stable. We don't want the test to break every time we change an implementation detail in the code. We'd like them to be fast, because we know what happens when they are not. And we want them to be few. We want, 
the code that we write for tests to be the most parsimonious expression of the proofs. We don't want extra lines of unnecessary test code that we have to maintain. So thorough, stable, fast view. This is what we're looking for in our unit tests. And achieving this, finding this, takes a sort of clarity of vision about your application. So do a thought experiment for me. Close your eyes if you have to. So imagine an app that you're working on right now and construct a picture of it in your mind, like the, not the files on disk, but the running app in memory, the objects and the messages that are passing between. Like, draw a picture in your head of that pattern. What does it look like? Yeah, spaghetti. <laughs> For many of us, it looks like this. Our applications grow up into these complicated tangles of code. And when our apps feel like this, it's no wonder that tests escape our control. We don't understand what's going on. And the way out of this thicket is to follow the message. And the magic tricks I'm about to show you, they focus on messages. And fortunately, the objects that we're going to unit test, they have a really simple view of messages. Objects are black boxes. They're like space capsules. They have an inside and an outside, and they are very motivated to keep these, those two things apart. The cold, dark, lonely outside is dangerous, and it's a matter of life and death to maintain a clear separation between outside and in. So from the point of view of the object under test, it only knows a few things about messages. It doesn't matter how many you have or how complicated they are. Every message it knows about comes from one of three places. The object under test, receives messages from others. These are incoming messages. These incoming messages blast holes in the containment wall of the space capsule. You have to be really careful and not let the outside see in. Next, it sends messages. They're outgoing messages. Again, holes in the containment. You can't let the inside see out. The third place where messages originate is the, the object under test sends them to itself. Now, these messages are completely contained within the space capsule. They're invisible to anything on the outside. So here's what we have. These are the three origins of messages from the point of view of the object under test. And then these messages, they come in two flavors, types. They can be queries or commands. A query message, you run a, qu a query message doesn't have side effects. So if you were to send plus to an integer, a calculation is often a really good example of a query message, right? You care about the thing you get back, but it doesn't change anything that any other part of your app can see. In contrast, command messages are really just the opposite. A command message has a side effect, but, but returns nothing that you depend on. So sending save to a subclass of active record would be a command message, right? It writes in the database, and all the other parts of your app can see that. Every programmer here has probably been burned by a message that was both a query and a command. You go to a code base you don't know very well, they tell you to make a change. You go find a likely message that gives you the result that you want. You use that message in your code, you deploy it into production, and then later you overhear someone wondering why you just sent 10,000 emails. <laughs> right? Like, unexpected, those hidden side effects are the bane of programmers. Now, so what, it, it, how are, it's, it's just, we do this all the time, we have to conflate command and query. The perfect example is popping something off a queue. It's really hard to think of a way to separate those. I, when I say pop, I get the thing back, right? That's the query part. And it changes the queue so that other parts of my app, if they look at the queue, they see a difference. That's the command part. So it isn't evil to conflate command and queries. And we do it all the time in Ruby, especially since every, there's always an automatic return, which makes it easy to chain messages together, right? That, that's going to happen in our code bases. However, these things get tested differently. And so it's really important to understand if you have a command or a query or both. And so now that we know those, the three kinds of origins of messages and the two types, we can make this grid. There are six cells on this grid, and every cell has a different rule about how to test it. The point of this talk is to fill out this grid. So we're going to start looking at code now, and I'm really sorry about you people. Hey in the distant back. Um, you, feel free to stand up and walk forward if, if there's something you can't see and you want to see the code samples. The code samples that we're about to look at, I made up. They're simple and really straightforward, and conveniently enough, they exactly prove my points. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
there's a, if you're interested in this, uh, Katrina Owen, whom you may know from her therapeutic refactoring talk last fall or her voice on the Ruby Rogues, she, she's doing a talk this spring called Zero Confidence, where she takes these rules and she applies them to the test suite of an open source project on GitHub. It's a cliffhanger, as you might imagine. So if you're interested in this, have a look, keep an eye out for her talk. So filling out the grid. The first one is incoming query messages. So we, of course, have a bicycle. It has a wheel. There's a diameter message. It's, the, it's implemented just like this. So diameter is a query. It changes nothing but does a calculation and returns a result. The way, we, the way we're going to test it is like this. We're going to get a new instance of the object and make an assertion about the value that's sent back when we send the message. Now, I know that many of you in here have never seen many tests. It does exactly what you think. Okay. The only part of this that might be a little confusing is this assertion. The in delta. This is just an assertion about a value. The in delta part says this is, returns a float, and so this is like it's within 0.01 of being 29. So that's a really straightforward assertion, just about a value, just like you're used to if you use RSpec or whatever that other framework is. Um, this is that is this is not an endorsement of the testing framework. So it's a simple method. It has an incredibly simple test, and that's all there is to it. We have the first rule. Test incoming query message by making assertions about what they send back, about their result. Some people will say about state. Now, I'm not an academic, so I'm always really confused about what they mean. Every time I hear the word state, I think North Carolina. <laughs> and so, if, I mean, feel free to use that word if it has meaning to you, but don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense. We're talking about what gets sent back here. It's a, a check. It's an assertion about a value. And so there you go. One down, five to go. But of course, there's one more. I'm going to just do one more incoming query message before we move on across that chart. Here's a gear class. It represents a bicycle gear. It implements this gear inches method, which if you're a cyclist, you know what that is. And if you're not, you don't care. So here's the implementation of the method. It sends a private message to itself. And it sends a message to a collaborating object. This is a query message. There are no side effects. Nothing changes as a result of this. How should we test this? Well, it turns out the point of view, the point of view to adopt to answer that question is to think about sighting along the edges of the space capsule. If you're standing right there, all you can see is the messages and parameters as they come in and the results as they go back out. So if you stand there, the test that you write looks just like this. It looks exactly like the test before. It sends the message, and it makes an assertion about the value that gets returned as a result of that message sent. I can't see inside the space capsule, so I don't care how this gets done. I just care about what comes back. We want to test the interface, not the implementation. If I test only the interface, it means I can change the implementation without breaking the test. And that's our goal for testing. So, and that's it for incoming query messages. Make assertions about what they return, test the interface and not the implementation. All right, moving on. Incoming command messages. Gear also has this set cog message. This is how uh, when players change gears on their bike, they'll send set cog. It takes an argument. It assigns the, that, the value of that argument to this variable, and there's an adder reader on it. Now, don't worry that there's, that kind of looks like you could have, set cog could have been adder accessor, but I'm going to make that method bigger later. So bear with me on the fact. Like, don't get hung up on the fact that there could be more in there. So in this case, the this is a query command combo. It returns the result here. That's the query part. And it sets this value so that when other people send cog later, they see a different thing. Right? I'm going to test the command part of this. And this test, again, is incredibly simple. I'm going to get a new instance of gear. I'm going to send the message that causes the side effect. And then I'm going to make an assertion about the value of the side effect. The rule here, test incoming command messages by making assertions about direct public side effects. Now, public side effects, that's, it's pretty clear what a public side effect is. Direct, I'm defining direct right now as it, it's the responsibility of the last Ruby class involved. And I'm just going to ask you to live with that idea for a little bit, and we can talk about it more later. Um, and so now that we're here, I, you know, here, wait. I love my. Last time I did that, someone pulled one out of the audience and 
shined it on the board. This is not an invitation. <laughs> so now that we've filled out this first row and we're making assertions about values, I can tell you that we've reached the point where I can reveal a magical secret. We're done making assertions about values. There's no place else in this grid where we're going to test the value returned by anything. So incoming messages, it is the responsibility, when you're unit testing, the receiver of the incoming message is the place where you make assertions about values. You do that here and nowhere else, and it will become more clear why as you see the other examples. And so that's it for row one. We're, in, we're on to messages sent to self. The Gehrig's uh, method sends a private message. There's this ratio private method that we're using. How should we test it? Well, you're all here, so you probably know a better question is how not to test it. So some people are tempted to create an explicit test for it, to send the message and make an assertion about what comes back. Think about this from sighting along the edges of the space capsule point of view. As far as the rest of your app is concerned, this method does not exist. If the gear inches method, there, you have a, public, a method in your public interface that calls it. If the test for gear inches is correct, this must be right. If you, this test, this test is redundant. It doesn't add any value. It binds you to what you have now. It, while it is true, it is true that redundancy is sometimes something you might want to keep. <laughs> How cute are they? Not in your tests, all right? Um, so now let's look at a second, pa second anti-pattern for private tests. So some people say, okay, and let me say this. The people who, who do these things, who are they? They're people who care, right? The people who don't care are not writing these tests. So this is not a criticism. This is an attempt to like, shed some clarity on this issue so that the people who care can do things that are less painful and more useful. And so I have this private method. Here's what people say. They say, well, I send it in the Geertz's method. If I, don't, if I don't send it, Geertz's can't possibly be right. And so they take this perfectly good test that is complete proof that it's OK, and they do this. You see it all the time. They set an expectation that an outgoing query message will that I'm sorry, they set an expectation that a private method will get sent. This expectation is an over-specification. It adds costs and provides absolutely no benefit. It binds you to the current implementation. A test that insists that you continue to send an invisible message creates a world where you can't improve the code without breaking the test. This expectation does not make it safe to refactor. It makes it impossible to do so. So don't do this. And the rules for private methods are don't test them. Don't make assertions about their values. Don't set expectations that you'll send them. Now, as we all know, we live in a practical world, and all rules are meant to be broken. I break this rule all the time. If you have a complicated private algorithm, you may not be able to get it running unless you TDD it. If you're, if you're dinking around with a complicated private algorithm, it can be really helpful to get an error message near the offending line of code. However, what I would tell you is while these tests might have value early on, as time passes, what they do is they keep other people from being willing to improve your private code because they do not want to screw with those tests. When I leave, when, after I write tests of private methods, very often I just can't bear to delete them at that point in time. They're like my children, right? Like I'm really attached to them. And so if I leave tests of private methods in a test, I segregate them, I put them all together in one place, and then I compound my sins by putting a comment in my test, and that comment says this, if these tests fail, delete them. <laughs> right? There is a point, if you keep them, you're on, it's a slippery slope. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to switch to where instead of saving you money, they are going to cost you money. And you should proactively delete those tests before that happens. Don't let your private tests keep people from improving your code because they don't want to deal with those tests. And so that's it for messages sent to self. The rule, the adult rule is ignore them. And the practical rule is do what saves you money. And so now part three, um, outgoing query messages. So first, spoiler alert. So I'm going to show, so we're in the outgoing query message cell. I'm going to show you 
we're going to derive rules that are just exactly like the rules we just derived. And I'm going to show you examples that are going to give you deja vu because they're going to look exactly like the examples you just saw. So I'm going to whip through them, and then we're going to talk about why these things are the same. So we've already looked at these two things. These are both uh, query messages to these objects. We're testing gear, so we're standing at gear's point of view. Um, gear sends, has a collaborating object that's wheel, so it sends, this, it sends wheel, the diameter to the wheel object. And so, as is always true here, somebody's incoming is somebody else's outgoing. So if I'm standing over here, if my universe is the universe where I'm uh, unit testing gear, that diameter message to wheel is an outgoing query message. So how should we test this? Well, again, the better question is how not to test it. Here's our perfectly good test that is complete proof that the gear inches method works correctly. Sometimes people who cannot forget what they've seen inside the space capsule feel honor bound to do this, to make an assertion about the value that's returned as a result of sending the outgoing query message. Now, remember, the receiver of an incoming query is solely responsible for assertions that involve state. This test is redundant. It duplicates a test that it, it's the exact test that's already over in wheel. And when you make this assertion here, you've, you've made it so that you cannot change the implementation without breaking the test over in wheel and then breaking the test in all of the places where you've also done this. It is unnecessary as proof of correctness of the result of gear inches. Again, there are times when you might want to keep redundancy. I don't know, you know, nobody ever really laughs at that picture. And I, I don't understand it. I, is it a shock? You have my permission to laugh, if you want. <laughs> yeah, those dogs are, they're kind of alarming, I agree. It, it's an anti-pattern to do, all right, to keep that, to, to duplicate that test in the outgoing query side. So here's another anti-pattern. Sometimes, again, people of goodwill say, well, I, I surely have to send it. Surely, I must send that, or it won't be correct. This, again, is an over-specification. It proves nothing. All it does is bind you to the current implementation and make it impossible to change the code without breaking the test. And so that's it for outgoing query messages. Don't test them. Don't make assertions about what they return. And don't set expectations that you'll send them. Now, so these are just like messages sent to self. And the reason is that messages that objects, the unit test object sends to itself and outgoing query messages, messages that don't have side effects that it sends to other objects, they both are without side effects. So from the sending side, if you're sending a message that doesn't have side effects, it is invisible to the rest of your app. And if the, if the message is invisible to the rest of your app, the, on the sending side, you should not test it. That test is a waste of time. It's an over-specification. It adds no proof. And so that's it for outgoing query messages. Just ignore them. And so, well, that's, that's looking promising, isn't it? Not much code yet. All right, so the last cell on the grid, outgoing command messages. And in order to illustrate this, I have to change my example a little bit. Um, you've already seen the stuff on the top. The change here, like assume now that this is a game where players race bicycles. And when players change gears, they, th that has to bubble up somehow so the game can change the behavior of the bicycle as a whole. So the set cog message gets sent to gear, and when that happens, I have this new sort of pseudo observer object and it's gonna have to get sent changed. That's how the rest of the app finds out that a gear was changed. And I'll just, I'm just gonna make some fairly arbitrary changes in the code. I'm gonna inject the thing I'm calling observer. It's not really a strict observer pattern, but it's gonna watch. And then in the set cog method, I'll just fix it. I'll just, it's gonna send change to itself, and change is implemented this way. It's gonna send the chain ring and the cog out to that observer message. And so here's a picture of what just happened. Uh, changed has side effects, and we're, I'm not gonna test that, but just trust me that it does. And let's assume for the sake of this example that it writes in the database. So if observer gets changed, it's gonna do some save in the database that will be visible to other parts of the app. So to the, to the observer, changed is an incoming command message. And so of course it's an outgoing command from the object that we're testing, gear. And because it's an outgoing command message, we have something new. This message has to get sent. Unlike with the outgoing query messages, we have to send this message or the app will not be correct. It creates side effects upon which others depend. And so it can be really tempting here to test the side effect. You could write code that triggered the outgoing message, 
and then makes assertions about what happens when you do. Okay, so the, think about what's going on here. I am asserting that when I send some message to some other object, that it sends maybe some messages to other objects, that eventually does something, and my test is going to bind me to the thing that happens. This, this creates a dependency between you and every object and message between you and that distant side effect. And it might be a long way away. Changing the database is not Gear's responsibility. It should not even know that that's happening. Reaching across a bunch of intermediate objects and testing a distant side effect is an integration test. And this is an integration test. It's just hiding in your unit test directory. Gear's job is not to do this thing. It's to send this message. And testing that a message got sent requires using a mock. You make a mock. You eject the mock. You set an expectation that you're going to send the message. You trigger the event. And then in many tests, there's a separate verify step that makes the mock go. This test does not depend on all the objects and messages between you and the distant side effect. This test depends on the message. It tests the thing for which gear is responsible. It tests at the nearest edge. Now, code that can tolerate change couples to stability. And testing, testing in this way places a bet. The bet is that the API, the nearest edge, that message that you're sending is more stable than the path, than the distant side effect and the path to it. So if you test this with a mock, you get fast and stable for free. You don't have to run all that code between you and the side effect. And I'm fully aware that I just used the words mock and stable in the same sentence. <laughs> right? And I, I, I understand how you might have an objection, but hang in there. All right? So here's the rule. Test outgoing command messages by setting expectations on them, set, setting, expecting that you send them. And there are caveats here, too, as always. Sometimes the side effect is cheap and close. And if it is, ah, just plug in the object. Right? Everything is simpler if you do. Just use it. I don't care if it's a value object and it's close. But the further away, the, more, the further away that side effect and the more expensive it is to occur, the better off you are to depend on the stable edge instead of binding yourself to all the things between you and that side effect. And so here's the final grid. This is it. This is all you have to do. And so now, if you're a minimalist, if you're a unit testing minimalist, you've got to use mocks. And I can hear some of you, I can hear you thinking this. Aren't they fragile? Well, what happens? What happens when observer stops implementing changed? So we know what happens. Some of us do. If you've been around long enough, you know. This is what happens. It hurts. It hurts really bad. And if you were uh, writing Ruby and Rails code a few years ago when that mock everything mania overtook us, you may, like me, have created uh, universes where you had these elaborate, uh, complicated suites of tests that all ran green while your apps were badly broken. <laughs> okay? We, I know, we know better now. We know better. This is not the fault of mocks. We just weren't using them right. And here's the deal. A mock is a test double. It, it plays the role of some object in your real app. So you have some role, which is a separate thing. I have an object in my app that plays a role. I have a test double that plays that role. If you're, the fake thing and the real thing both promise that they're going to implement a common API. And it is your job to ensure that your fakes, that your doubles, keep that promise. These magic tricks require mocks. But if you're going to use them, you have to keep them in sync. Now, you can try to do this by hand. I can promise you that will not work. <laughs> or you can get some help. And it turns out, in the last couple of years, there's a ton of help. Now, I'm not going to talk about this. We're, we're down. We're at the three-minute mark here, OK? I'm not going to tell you anything about this, except to say that there's plenty of way now. There are many things available in Ruby now that allow you to create mocks and stubs, to use mocks and stubs in your test doubles, and know confidently that they're not going to stray from the API. Uh, the only other thing I'll tell you about this is if you've want, been wanting to give a talk and you're unable to find a topic, do one on this. There's like plenty. There's this. This is the next wave, I think, of things that we want to do, and we can really fruitfully learn to use all these techniques. So I'm asserting that you should use mocks and that you can safely, and that's please accept that as a truth. And so that's it. 
28 minutes, 28 minutes and 26 seconds of magic tricks. The minimal set of tests. Now you can, you can write more unit tests than I've specified, but they're unnecessary and every one of them adds a cost. This set is proof enough. So if you learn these rules, you can experiment with them and once you understand them, you can break them wherever it'll save you money. The rules let you test everything in just one place. They give you thorough coverage in the fewest tests possible. They sight along the edges of the space capsule so the tests are stable and they make it both safe and cheap to refactor. Because the rules trust that collaborators will just do the right thing if you send the right message, they're fast because they don't have to wait on all those distant side effects. These rules are simple and this is our job to find the simplicity that lives at the heart of complexity. Like everything else in programming, tests often get worse right before they're about to get better. And if you stop before you reach simplicity, you will never get tests that you can love. Don't give up midway down this path. Have faith that it's possible. Strive until you achieve it. Believe in this. Getting better at testing takes practice. But if you persist, tests be Tests can become the wall at your back instead of the millstone around your neck. And you can turn this thicket of insanity into a beautiful garden of tests and go home every day saying, I love my tests. Thank you. <laughs>